Welcome to Open Book, Episode 10, How to Read Shakespeare's Villains, the first in a three-part series that focuses on Richard III. I'm Michael Elliott, Associate Professor of English at the University of Calgary, and these episodes of Open Book are a little different from my usual format in their focus on a single character from one or more of Shakespeare's plays, namely their villains. Each episode, 10, 11, and 12, are going to examine one villain's characteristics, language, and role in their genre, namely tragedy or history. These episodes are also a bit less formally structured than others in this season, with fewer musical interludes and a more conversational style. I'm offering here a set of character studies rather than studies of complete texts. And although I will recount the stories of the plays in which these villains appear, each of these talks focuses on a single character and their pivotal roles in those plays. As I'm focusing on villains, their role is both to make life difficult for heroes and to advance their own interests. Or to put this another way, villains are motivated by their own interests. They're often fueled, of course, by grudges against heroes. But villains are proponents of vice over virtue, of private gains over public goods, of self-advancement over everything. Another feature of villains is that they are outsiders. They are alienated from the mainstream, from the main story, from other characters. They've often been pushed to the edges of their societies. And so the plays in which they appear often witness them fighting their way back in by any means necessary. Their machinations and plots usually return them to positions of influence even if that influence is, is for bad outcomes. I'm going to address three facets of Richard, the villain, uh, today. And I'm going to talk first about the genre in which he appears. Secondly, I'm going to address many of the features that Richard has. That is particularly his ambition, his duplicity, his ruthlessness, and also his alienation from others in the plays in which he appears. And finally, I'm going to go through a number of his most important speeches from the third part of Henry VI and from Richard III, uh, ordered according to different themes uh, and talking about different facets of Richard's rhetoric and his self presentation and his self-conception uh, through and his way of convincing other people as well as convincing himself of things all the way through those plays. Let's start with a consideration of the genre of the history play and how villains fit into it. Richard is in two of Shakespeare's history plays as a as a very as a pivotal character i should say he's a, he's a main character in two plays one of them is the third part of henry the 6th and the other of course is his uh, most famous star turn in the history play richard the 3rd which is effectively a sequel to 3 henry 6 just as a matter of explanation, Shakespeare wrote 10 history plays altogether. Uh, many of them have Richard or Henry in the title, uh, and eight of them in particular follow in a, I won't say unbroken sequence, but certainly in sequence from another, starting with uh, Richard the Second, going to Henry the Fourth, parts one and two, and then Henry the Fifth. After that follows the four, three parts of Henry the Sixth, and then finally Richard the Third. There are two others that don't fit into this sequence of history plays. History plays are a slightly 
different genre to Shakespeare's other two main genres, which are, you might know, comedy and tragedy. The main difference between them and those other genres is effectively that they are characterized not by the internal shape of what story they tell, that is, happy ending or sad ending, or what sorts of characters they present, or what sorts of events uh, they contain. But no, in fact, what makes a history play a history play is the very fact that it is based on English domestic history from the Middle Ages. This was a genre that Shakespeare cut his teeth on. It was one of the very first ones that he wrote, and it was also absolutely ubiquitous in the Elizabethan stage at the time. That is, the London stage that he was writing for. Um, one, many of the defenses, for instance, of the stage that were put forward were that the um, spectators, at the very least, would be learning something about their domestic history and main heroes. I say domestic, but in fact, what I also mean are most often uh, foreign wars, like uh, the wars in which uh, Henry V, for example, defeated the French at the Battle of Agincourt. That isn't to say that any play that is based on history is necessarily a history play, just to be a tiny bit confusing, <laughs> because there are other plays like um, Macbeth, for example, based on Scottish history, uh, King Lear, based on, well, I suppose we would call it quite um, legendary early history, a play like Cymbeline, which is really never read, but it's actually quite a very good play, uh, is not a history play. Those three are respectively uh, tragedies or romances, which, are, which is a whole other kettle of fish. And similarly, many plays that we call history plays take on many of the characteristics of tragedy. And one of the best examples of that is right before us. It's the example of Richard III, the most tragic in form and shape and character of any of Shakespeare's history plays. Part of the reason for that is that it owes to a tradition in the 16th century in English of the, something called the Senecan tragedy. Seneca was a classical Roman playwright who had written a great number of tragedies which were widely admired, imitated, translated, performed, and quite influential in the 16th century in England. The most characteristic feature of them, well, there were two, really. One is that they have a great number of offstage events that are uh, described by breathless messengers rushing in to describe the horrors that they have just witnessed. So it's a bit unusual in that these tragedies have many events, many of their main events, their most horrific events happen outside of our view, off just off stage, and are just reported by, verbally. But the other feature is that they often have a tyrant in charge, a tyrant who is capricious, that is, who easily changes his mind, who easily uh, sentences people to death for apparently no reason, who will do anything and is ruthlessly advancing himself and his interests and those of his friends, often with whom he has complots or conspiracies in front of the audience, uh, in order to then elaborate uh, on those plans through quite... Um, quite long rhetorical speeches, descriptions, yes, but also speeches of persuasion. Another tradition that is worth knowing about before we read our first speech by Richard of Gloucester, which is coming up, is the tradition of the medieval dramatic character known as the vice, or in a curious twist, was known as the Machiavel. Now, Machiavel was a Florentine bureaucrat, kind of mild-mannered in many ways, who had the 
fortune, I suppose you could say, of having a long afterlife on the English stage. Why? Because he had written A Guide to Princes, a book of political philosophy called Il Principe, which was translated, published as The Prince, and it was a book of political philosophy effectively telling princes that they should, I suppose the most famous line is, it is better to be feared than to be loved. They should be ruthless, they should be ambitious, they should do whatever it takes to hold on to power. It was a sort of guidebook to ruthless political self-promotion in an age of Italian fracturing city-states and internecine warfare and all sorts of uh, political turmoil that was a practical guy that Machiavelli had written. It does seem, in retrospect, a, an unusual way, an unusual source for someone to become a figure of viciousness and horror, uh, of, of calculation uh, on the English stage. But I think it's fair to say that, like Charles Darwin or Sigmund Freud um, or Karl Marx, uh, Machiavelli was probably someone who was known far more by reputation than by direct reading experience. Let's have some reading experience of our own and see what kind of uh, figure Richard cut when he first appeared or first really revealed himself and his true interests. This is a speech that I'm going to read you from Henry the, King Henry VI, Part 3. It's Act 3, Scene 2, lines 182 following to the end of that scene. Richard has just been told that his brother Edward is going to move toward, who's going to be favored as the inheritor of the English crown. And Richard, being the third son, unfortunately, is therefore third in line after his brother Edward and then his next brother Clarence, along with their various children. He is the, not the third, he is, he's quite a ways down the line for himself to become king. And yet, spoiler alert, uh, by the end of the uh, Richard III, he is going to, in fact, be Richard III. Here he says that he is going to um, do anything it takes in order to get the crown. He says, I, I'm actually going to start a bit earlier than what I said. Let me see. Let me start, in fact, at line 165 of that, of that scene. Then, since this earth affords no joy to me but to command, to check, to orbear such as are of better person than myself, I'll make my heaven to dream upon the crown and whiles I live, to count this world but hell, until my misshaped trunk that bears this head be round, impaled with a glorious crown. And yet I know not how to get the crown, for many lives stand between me and home, and I, like one lost in a thorny wood that rents the thorns and is rent with the thorns, seeking a way and straying from the way, not knowing how to find the open air, but toiling desperately to find it out, torment myself to catch the English crown. And from that torment I will free myself or hew my way out with a bloody axe. Why, I can smile and murders whiles I smile and cry content to that which grieves my heart and wet my cheeks with artificial tears, and frame my face to all occasions. I'll drown more sailors than the mermaid shall. I'll slay more gazers than the basilisk. I'll play the orator as well as Nestor, deceive more slyly than Ulysses could, and, like a Sinon, take another Troy. I can add colors to the chameleon, change shapes with Proteus, for advantages, and set the murderous Machiavel to school. Can I do this, and cannot get a crown? Tot, were it further off, I'll pluck it down. 
There's a lot to say about this speech. The first is that when he refers in line 170 to my misshaped trunk, it is in fact because Richard had a physical deformity, a curved spine, and one of his arms was, as he put it later, like a blasted sapling withered up. So he was alienated from others by this by this difference, this physical difference from them. When, that's why the, he refers to the misshaped trunk. His line about, about hewing his way out uh, from the thorns with a, with a bloody axe uh, is a vivid illustration of the way that he feels trapped by his family, familial relationships and is going to do whatever it takes, including murder of, murdering them uh, willy-nilly, uh, in order to uh, emerge victorious at the top of this heap. But he then transitions and says, not that he's only uh, exclusively going to use force, but mostly he is going to be false. He is going to smile and murder whiles I smile. He is going to betray people. He is going to... Um, pretend to cry and frame my face to all occasions. That is, uh, he's going to pretend to be something he is not or feel things he does not feel. Um, all of the references then to playing, these classical references, you have a cluster of them about, about talking about playing the orator um, um, as well as Nestor, uh, better than Ulysses, and taking another Troy like Sinon. Those are three references to Greek heroes, or rather Greek um, uh, generals and, uh, and, and, and uh, kings who had used their power in order to, their, their power of language, in order to, Nestor spoke at great length, famously, but also Ulysses was a great deceiver, um, one who was excellent at manipulating others through his words. And so Richard is looking to all of these different examples uh, as places that he can take inspiration, including ultimately the murderous Machiavel, who he, whom he is going to teach a thing or two about villainy. But all of this is at the moment merely perspective. It is all just some, a glimmer in Richard of Gloucester's eyes. And Shakespeare doesn't put him at the center stage until he gets his own play, Richard III. That play begins with a very memorable speech, a soliloquy by Richard alone on stage, addressing the audience, effectively introducing himself to audiences and saying what he intends to do that he has various plots that he is ready to um, that he is ready to perpetrate against his brothers and his other enemies that he feels that he is out of step with the times uh, and he introduces himself in quite vivid language, especially as well that he, to say um, along the lines of this speech from Henry VI that he is going to deceive others with alacrity. In this speech from Act I, Scene I of Richard III, the first thing to know in advance is that, uh, firstly, this is a moment after the wars that, that consumed England, the Wars of the Roses, that consumed England during the um, much of the 15th century, these have come to a close. The year is 1483, and Edward IV is on the throne, that is, Richard of Gloucester's eldest brother. And Richard steps forward onto the stage, well, he really shuffles forward because Shakespeare's character really exaggerated his physical deformity uh, beyond what was true in the historical record. Uh, and he says exactly how different, how, what an outsider he feels in contrast to this new world. Here's what he says. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer. 
by this son of York, and all the clouds that lowered upon our house in the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim-visaged war hath smoothed his wrinkled front, and now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber, to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. Just in these first thirteen lines, you can see how alienated Richard already feels. Uh, alienated, that is, from this world of leisure, this world of pleasures, of post-war relief, of, of merry meetings and delightful measures and, and so on, and, 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 and lute playing and courtly pleasures. But Richard does not fit in. Here's what he says, starting in line 14. But I that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking-glass, I, that am rudely stamped, and want love's majesty to strut before an anton, ant, wom, wanton ambling nymph, I, that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated a feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world scarce half made up, and that so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt by them. Why, I, in this weak piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time, unless to see my shadow in the sun and descant on mine own deformity. And, therefore... Since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. There's a very curious paradox at the center of what Richard is saying, or rather, what Richard is capable of doing. And concentrate particularly on the way that all the way through this speech, he's talking about the moment in which he finds himself. He's alienated from this moment. He's incapable of capering nimbly in a lady's chamber. He's incapable of having delights to pass this time, in this weak piping time of peace and so on. He doesn't fit into this moment. He can't prove, that is, become or demonstrate himself to be a lover to entertain these days, and therefore I am determined to prove a villain. And he then talks about the plots that he's laid against his brothers. The duplicity, that, or rather the paradox I was talking about, is that he says that he doesn't fit in, and yet, and yet, everything that he is going to do will be a manner of appearing to fit in, appearing to, to, to be similar to people in order to persuade them of something, in order to use their weaknesses and their desires against themselves in order to further his desires. In other words, he is out of step with the times, and yet he's going to do everything possible within these times to seek the ends that he has in mind. It is fair to say that Richard has quite a low self-regard. He is constantly referring to himself as a physically deformed person. That is to say, his self-regard is quite low of his physical self, but not of his mental acuity, certainly his abilities to take advantage of the moment that he finds himself in. And he repeatedly says that there's a discordance, there's a, there's a disagreement between his, uh, deceptive, the, his appearance and his internal self. In the very next scene, Richard undertakes to do something really extraordinary, and that is to convince the widow 
of the man that Richard has killed in battle to marry him, Richard. So this is Edward, the Prince of Wales, whom Richard killed. Uh, he then, he's, he's lying there, being taken to his grave when uh, Richard intercepts the funeral procession and, in fact, in an extraordinary turn, he manages to convince Lady Anne, the, uh, the, the wife of Edward, to marry Richard himself, to take up Richard as, a, as, a, as, her, as her prospective husband. And so Richard, at the end of this, has, is marveling at his ability, has, at his rhetorical skill that has managed to make this happen. He reflects on, uh, the, again, the deception, the difference between his appearance uh, and what she apparently thinks of him, that he's been able to win her consent, and he's positively gleeful uh, about what he's been capable of doing. This is Act 1, Scene 2, Line 230 following. Was ever woman in this humor wooed? Was ever woman in this humor won? I'll have her, but I will not keep her long. What, I that killed her husband and his father to take her in her heart's extremest hate, with curses in her mouth, tears in her eyes, the bleeding witness of my hatred by... Having God, her conscience, and these bars against me, and I no friends to back my suit withal, but the plain devil and dissembling looks, and yet to win her, all the world to nothing. Has she forgot already that brave prince Edward, her lord, whom I, at some three months since, stabbed in my angry mood at Tewkesbury? A sweeter and a lovelier gentleman, framed in the prodigality of nature, young, valiant, wise, and no doubt right royal, the spacious world cannot again afford. And will she yet abase her eyes on me, that cropped the golden prime of this sweet prince and made her widow to a woeful bed? On me, whose all not equals Edward's moiety. On me, that halts and am misshapen thus. My dukedom to a beggarly denier, I do mistake my person all this while. Upon my life she finds, although I cannot, myself to be a marvellous proper man. I'll be at charges for a looking-glass, and entertain a score or two of tailors to study fashions to adorn my body. Since I am crept in favour with myself, I will maintain it with some little cost, but first I'll turn yon fellow in his grave, and then... Return, lamenting to my love. Shine out, fair son, till I have bought a glass, that I may see my shadow as I pass. And that last line deliberately contrasts, or echoes rather, with the earlier line he said about how, uh, how he walks along so lamely and unfashionably that dogs bark at me as I halt past them, etc., he does not like, has not liked his shadow before. He has not admired his appearance, and yet he's amazed that she apparently takes it and appreciates it and wants him and uh, desires him in ways that he doesn't recognize his own desirability. But he is growing in his self regard. Now, that's just an early part of the play, and a great deal happens that I won't be able to cover. Uh, in this in this talk today, but really, what happens next is that uh, ultimately, I should say, is that R Richard orchestrates along with his accomplice uh, Buckingham. His, his his accomplice's name. He orchestrates a kind of very. Hmm, he, he's able to convince people that he himself um, is willing to take up the crown, but only only in a very reluctant, only in very reluctant circumstances. He has orchestrated the removal of both of his brothers and all of their children. And Buckingham then approaches Richard in the company of the citizens of London and asks him for the good of the country, for the good of the nation, to take up the crown. Well, I should say there are, in fact, two of Edward's sons 
who are able and ready to take up the crown. But unfortunately, their loving uncle has put them into the Tower of London, the residence slash prison where they are not going to survive. Anyway, this is what Richard says to Buckingham. Act 3, scene 7, line 140, following. After Buckingham asks him to take up your right of birth, your empery, and your own. Richard says, I cannot tell if to depart in silence or bitterly to speak in your reproof best fitteth my degree or your condition. If not to answer, you might haply think tongue-tied ambition not replying yielded to bear the gold and yoke of sovereignty, which fondly you would here impose on me. If to reprove you for this suit of yours, so seasoned with your faithful love to me, then on the other side I checked my friends. Therefore, to speak, and to avoid the first, and then in speaking not to incur the last, definitively thus I answer you. Your love deserves my thanks, but my desert unmeritable shuns your high request. First, if all obstacles were cut away, and that my path were even to the crown, as the ripe revenue and due of birth, yet so much is my poverty of spirit, so mighty and so many my defects, that I would rather hide me from my greatness, being a bark to brook no mighty sea, than in my greatness covet to be hid, and in the vapour of my glory smothered. What's really glorious about this speech, or really, really what, what's most pleasurable, uh, uh, pleasurable about it, frankly, as, a, as an audience member, is that we know, we know that this is just a performance. We know that Richard has said to us directly, the audience members, so much more about his true ambitions. We know that this is merely a performance that he's putting on for the public citizens of London, meaning to perform a kind of piety, a perform a kind of reluctance so that he will get their consent. He will get their, their false agreement. Just as he got uh, Lady Anne's agreement to marry him, he will get what he wants. But only by appearing not to want it too badly. Eventually, of course, later in Act 3, Scene 7, eventually he relents. Eventually he says, he calls back Buckingham and the citizens and says in line 227 following, Since you will buckle fortune on my back to bear her burden where, where I will or no, I must have patience to endure the load. But if black scandal or foul-faced reproach attend the sequel of your imposition, your mere enforcement shall acquittance me from all the impure blots and stains thereof. For God doth know, and you may partly see, how far I am from the desire of this. It's very spiritual language about about impure blots and stains and, 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 and scandals and so on. If this turns out badly, in other words, don't let that affect me and, and, my, and my reputation. Let that be something that, that uh, is not... I, I was reluctant to do this, so I will do it if I must. If you insist, I will take up the crown. But... Please don't see this as any tiniest, tiniest blot of a jot of ambition. It's one of those interesting inversions in this play that at the beginning, Richard has said how much he is opposed to the tenor of the times in which he lives. And here he is suggesting that if the time demands it and the people require it, then he will very reluctantly agree to do as they wish. He uses a very similar argument in his next most daring request, and that is his request to Elizabeth, 
that is the wife of his now dead brother, Edward, for her to agree that he may, now that his wife, Anne, Richard's wife, Anne, has died mysteriously, uh, and in a sort of aside, he doesn't really give her much thought, he asks now for the hand of Elizabeth and Edward's daughter. This is after Richard has taken the crown, after Richard has imprisoned this daughter's uh, brothers because they stood between himself and the crown, after he has orchestrated his rise and now needs to consolidate his claim to the crown in, in order to... Uh, make sure that he doesn't lose it now that he has it. He's facing an armed rebellion, and he hopes that if this child uh, is to marry him, uh, this daughter of theirs, that that he will avoid all of the bloodshed that's going to happen. This is Act 4, Scene 4, line 397 following. This is what Richard says to Elizabeth. As I intend to prosper and repent, so thrive I in my dangerous affairs of hostile arms. Myself, myself confound. Heaven and fortune bar me happy hours. Day, yield me not thy light, nor night thy rest. Be opposite all planets of good luck to my proceeding, if, with dear heart's love, immaculate devotion, holy thoughts, I tender not thy beauteous princely daughter. In her consists my happiness and thine. Without her follows to myself and thee, herself, the land, and many a Christian soul, death, desolation, ruin, and decay. It cannot be avoided but by this. It will not be avoided but by this. Therefore, dear mother, I must call you so, be the attorney of my love to her. Plead what I will be, not what I have been, not my deserts, but what I will deserve. Urge the necessity and state of times, and be not peevish found in great designs. This is really a bridge too far. Really. This is Richard trying to convince both himself and Elizabeth, his sister in law, that this is truly what ought to happen, that this is truly what he does deserve. Plead what I will be, not what I have been. That's grasping. That is desperate. And I love this speech, not just because of its audacity, uh, and because it is uh, similar thematically to what he has done when he has won over Lady Anne, but also because of this line about confounding himself, myself, myself confound. Day yield me not light, nor night thy rest. Uh, and all these things happen if I am not truly devoted to your daughter. These are the vows that will really come back to defeat Richard, because, of course, he doesn't truly love her. He doesn't truly want her for her, all of these, these, these her beauty and her holiness, etc. But he wants her because he is seeking to legitimize something. Remember that line, myself, myself confound. When we come to the next speech, Act 5, Scene 3, when Richard is on the eve of battle, the battle that he is going to fight against the uh, enemies, against the, those who have uh, assembled the coalition uh, with the leadership of, of, of Henry, um, the Henry of Richmond, the, the future Henry VII, um, who is uh, going to defeat Richard III. Um, the night before this battle, Richard has a dream. A dream, well, it's in fact not a dream, but it, it's, a, it's another moment, by the way, which is straight out of Senecan uh, tragedy, straight out of Senecan drama, in which the ghosts of 
the two young princes, the ghost of Lady Anne, the ghost of his brothers, uh, the ghost of all the people that Richard has killed and stepped on, all of the those whose blood is on the bloody axe that he said he was going to cut through. They've all appeared before him in his dream. And he wakes up and says, line 179, O oh, coward conscience, how dost thou afflict me? The lights burn blue. It is now dead midnight. Cold, fearful drops stand on my trembling flesh. What do I fear? Myself? There's none else by. Richard loves Richard. That is, I am I. Is there a murderer here? No. Yes. I am. Then fly. What, for myself? Great reason why. Lest I revenge. What, myself upon myself? Alack, I love myself. Wherefore? For any good that I myself have done unto myself? Oh no, alas, I rather hate myself for hateful deeds committed by myself. I am a villain, yet I lie. I am not. Fool, of thyself speak well. Fool, do not flatter. My conscience hath a thousand several tongues, and every tongue brings in a several tale, and every tale condemns me for a villain. Perjury, perjury in the highest degree, murder, stern murder in the direst degree, all several sins, all used in each degree, throng to the bar, crying all guilty. Guilty, I shall despair. There's no creature loves me. And if I die, no soul will pity me. And wherefore should they, since that I myself find in myself no pity to myself? Methought the souls of all that I had murdered came to my tent, and every one did threat tomorrow's vengeance on the head of Richard. It is fair to say, in general, that villainy, being a villain, depends on quite an inflated self-regard, an ability to exert your will, an ability to assert your desires, an ability to believe in yourself and the inevitability or the, or the moral validity of your position, that you are not a villain. A villain who calls himself a villain? Well, we have seen Richard say that. I am determined to prove a villain. But here he calls himself a villain in quite a different way. Quite a different way. I am a villain, yet I lie. I am not. So the division in this speech, the division of Richard from himself, his former inflated self-conception that allowed him to uh, exert all these things, to, to, to assert this, this will on the world to destroy so many people in the singular devotion to his one ambition to get the crown, that is falling away. That is breaking down because of what he says, the coward conscience. The coward conscience, which has, as he says, all of these tongues that condemn me for a villain, condemn me. And he doesn't pity himself anymore. He doesn't agree. He doesn't share that belief. He doesn't agree with what he has done. He doesn't uh, believe that there was any excuse for it or any rational reason for it. So villainy depends on a very precarious kind of self-love. Richard has to fight very hard against this this coward conscience this this word conscience uh, because conscience is doubt conscience is the voice in any villain's head that says i am doing wrong and i should stop it and conscience is of course the also the source of his dreams so the night before, uh, as I say, he's had these terrible dreams in the, the night before the battle in which he loses his life and his crown. And one of Richard's last speeches is a speech to his army. But first he says to the men around him, uh, let not our babbling dreams affright our souls. This is line uh, 308 following in La Act 5, Scene 3. Conscience, he says, is but a word that cowards use devised at first to keep the strong in awe. 
our strong arms be our conscience, swords our law. March on, join bravely, let us do it pell-mell, if not to heaven, then hand in hand to hell. But ultimately, as seems inevitable, these shows of strength are actually masking an inner weakness. These shows of strength are not good enough to cover up the conscience that he knows is going to undermine him. And that is because, as Richard teaches us, the ruthlessness, uh, the ambition, the uh, deception, and the self-regard is all a kind of self-deception, ultimately. It is an effort to seem something that you are not. And the whole edifice has to come crashing down at some point. The whole structure of self-belief, with its empty core, with its empty center, has to fall in on itself. Myself, myself, confound, as Richard says. You've been listening to Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. The next episode is on Shakespeare's tragedy Titus Andronicus and its villain Aaron the Moor. Meanwhile, you can search me up in the usual places. It should turn up my blog if you spell my surname U-L-L-Y-O-T or go straight there by typing j.mp slash Elliot. You can also find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter in descending order of regularity. And then there's old-fashioned email. Elliot at ucalgary, that's U-C-A-L-G-A-R-Y dot C-A. The music from this episode is courtesy of the Open Well-Tempered Clavier Project and performed by Kimiko Ishizaka.